April 14th, 1912, exactly 104 years ago tonight, the Titanic hit an iceberg off the coast of Newfoundland. Within two and a half hours, it was at the bottom of the sea. 1,500 people died, only 700 survivors. On that ship, 130 Canadian-bound passengers. Tonight, we tell their story in conversation with Alan Hustick, author of Titanic, the Canadian story. Welcome to Pembroke, Alan. It's my pleasure. Let's start with your interest in the Titanic. Uh, it came from a very young age as a result of your grandfather, and it has grown from there. Well, both my grandfathers. Uh, one of my grandfathers, my paternal grandfather, uh, took me to an auction, and uh, I think I was five or six, and there was a box there, and I put up my hand and said, 50 cents, and, uh, for which he reprimanded me because the auction hadn't even begun. And uh, in the box was a book called, it was published in 1912, about the Titanic. So I was five or six and I had the book and it, it intrigued me. And my maternal grandfather had worked with a guy called Sage on the railway. My, grand, my maternal grandfather worked for the Canadian Pacific Railway, as almost everybody's maternal grandfather did. Uh, and he had worked with a guy called Sage who drowned in the Titanic. So as a kid, I'd heard these stories. But it really wasn't until uh, the 1970s. I was living in Calgary. I was a television reporter working for CTV. And I had a friend a little older than I was. And we would play Trivial Pursuit. And he would win every time. And one day, I suddenly said, I'm going to make up a question, and there's no way he can answer this. Who from Calgary was aboard Titanic? I, completely made up. And my friend looked at me and said, why, Burton Vera Dick, of course. And I didn't know whether he was putting me on or not. And in fact, this is 1974, 75. In fact, Bert and Vera Dick from Calgary were aboard Titanic. And Mort took me down to their house and showed me the house. And they had built a Titanic staircase. Uh, it was known and still is in Calgary known as the Titanic Staircase. Doesn't resemble the... Um, with that, I was, a, I was a journalist. And I had read Walter Lord's Night to Remember. I'd seen the movies. I'd had, I'd had an interest. And I suddenly said, wait a minute. If Bert and Vera Dick from Calgary were aboard the ship, who else from Canada was aboard the ship? Because I've read all the books. Uh, night to remember, no, no Canadians that I recall of. Um, being a television correspondent, you're on the road a lot. And uh, in those days, there was no internet, there was no instant Google. So as a hobby, whenever I was sent on assignment to Moose Jaw or Red Deer or whatever, I would go to the local library, and I would ask for the papers of 1912 and see if there were any local people. Um, by the mid-'80s, I got it at the back of my head that, hey, the centennial is coming. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a book about all the Canadians. Um, but I have, I have, what, 15, 20 years to do this. No Google, letters, interviews, conversations. In 1989, I came to work for the Montreal Gazette. I left television. I came to work for the Montreal Gazette. In those days, the paper had all kinds of money. And the 80th anniversary of the sinking was coming up. And I said, well, why don't we do a story about the Montrealers who were aboard Titanic? And they gave me free reign. 
uh, I had intended again that this book would be published for the centennial in 2012. And then a guy by James Cameron kind of screwed up that plan because he put out a movie. By then, I had enough material that a publisher says, oh, whoa, 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 you gotta, you gotta do a book, you gotta, oh, well, no, 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 I'm not finished. No, no, you, the film's out, you gotta do a book. So in 1997, the first book came out. And uh, we continue, the thing is when you put out, I, I'm, very, I'm very fortunate as an author because few authors have the chance to benefit People pointed out the mistakes in the first book, and then this thing called Google and the internet came along, and bang, uh, back and forth, I learned about more people, more stories, corrections to the mistakes in the original story, and 2012, of course, which is when I planned to write the book, was the centennial, and by then we put out the edition that you have there, um, the centennial edition of, of Titanic. Alan, I have the picture of Kate Winslet and Leonardo <laughs> DiCaprio up on the screen now from the, the movie Titanic. But you'd rather tell us a story about, this is a fictitious whoa, whoa, love whoa, story. Whoa, whoa. Let, let's this hear the real Cam one. This is Cameron's commercial version. You've all heard, oh, you're faster than I am. <laughs> Jack and Rose, that you've, I, how many people have ever seen the movie? Okay, so you know about Jack and Rose. Do you know who the real Jack and Rose are? There they are. When the guy is a guy called Quig Baxter. He's a hockey player from Montreal. The young girl, let's be polite, she was a cabaret singer that he met in Belgium. And uh, Quig was traveling with his mother, but he didn't want his mother to know that the cabaret singer was coming back with him. So the real Jack and Rose story is Quig and Bertha. Uh, she, was, she was traveling under the name of Madame de Villiers. Um, I ran into Cameron several years later, and I told him the Jack and Rose story, and he said, you know, originally my film was going to be about a male in third class, I'm sorry, about a male in first class and a female in third class, and had he known this story, uh, he would have kept, I mean, Cameron is a Canadian, and we have a Canadian hockey player, um, but the, the film, as wonderful as it is, is really a technical marvel, and, and the script is uh, a little sticky. Um, I mean, I much prefer the 1950, there, there's a version with Barbara Stanwyck and uh, Clifton Webb came out in the 1950s called Titanic, which is a much better film than Cameron's. It actually won the Academy Award uh, for Best Screenplay in 1952 or 53. So if you ever have a chance, it's in black and white, but Barbara Stanwyck, Robert Wagner makes his debut, um, and I think it's a much better film. But, uh, I want to talk some more about the, <clears throat> the Baxter family. So here's another picture of Quig and Bertha that's on the screen now. But the Baxter family there was some controversy in that family around Quig's father, and they were in Montreal. So talk a little bit about that story. And then... I, I love this story because I discovered it. <laughs> Even better. Um, Walter Lord, who, as you know, wrote uh, A Night to Remember, um, couldn't figure out who was in the second most expensive cabin on the ship. And it turned out to be... Quig Baxter and his mother. His mother was um, Hélène de Laudnière Chapu Baxter. Um, the family was Irish and Catholic. 
And being Irish and Catholic, they weren't particularly welcome in the um, uh, Protestant section of Montreal. The lovely story about the family is that his mother was really a French aristocrat, but she had no money. Uh, if those of you who are familiar with Quebec know the Laudemire region of Quebec, that was her family's ancestral property. Um, Diamond Jim Baxter was a uh, an Irishman, I like to think of him a little like Conrad Black. He, uh, he had position, he had money. And the lovely story about their meeting is that she had gone in to pawn some jewelry, a wedding ring or a ring. This comes from the family. And Diamond Jim looked at her and said, if you marry me, you don't have to pawn the ring. The rest is history. They get married. Uh, she's a rather pushy woman. She wants to live in the square mile. Catholics and Irish do not live in the square mile. She wants to live in the square mile. So Diamond Jim borrows some money from his bank. He owns the bank. But he borrows some money from the bank so his wife will be satisfied. And if you're ever in Montreal, if you know the city, right across the street from the Ritz is the Baxter family home that Diamond Jim bought for his wife. Um, the problem was it wasn't his money, and he gets arrested for embezzling, and he is sent to jail, and he dies. But he's left money in Belgium, he's left money in Switzerland, and there is a shopping mall on St. Lawrence Boulevard in Montreal known as the Baxter Block, one of the first in Canada, that Mrs. Baxter sells for about $11 million <coughs> so she can well afford to go to Europe. Um, the social season in Montreal, of course, begins in the fall. Having been disgraced, she takes her son and her quig, who, by the way, played for the Montreal Shamrocks, which won the Stanley Cup, forgive me, 1906 or 197, I'm not sure. Um, it's in the book. Um, he actually introduces the game of hockey to France. So in this, every, every uh, autumn, she would go with her son and her daughter over to France to check the investments and make sure everything's okay. Um, and then they would come back in the spring when all the rich people in Montreal went off to their cottages. And, uh, uh, and she booked the second most expensive cabin on Titanic, right next door to Bruce Ismay's, who was the owner of the White Star Line. Um, so that's, and while they were over there, he meets Bertha and says, come back to Canada with me. But he does not tell his mother or his sister that Bertha is aboard the ship. And she's in second class. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, very cleverly, if you look at the deck plans of the ship, um, the Baxters are ensconced in B-5860. But if you... Right outside is this little stairwell that goes right down to the deck below where she is. So after, um, I'm now speculating, after he put his mother to bed and his sister to sleep, it was just a matter of opening a door and going down a staircase to visit Bertha. Now, I don't know whether that happened or not. Now the Titanic hits the iceberg, and you believe that Quig Baxter is probably the first passenger to really know that the Titanic have, is about I, to sink. I have no doubt about that because we're Titanic experts always, or Titanic enthusiasts, always debate what happened as soon as the iceberg hits. We have on record 
Oh, one of the reasons that most people don't know, or Walter Lord didn't know about these, although the name is Baxter, they were Francophone. Because they were disgraced in Montreal, the newspapers didn't pay much attention to the fact, the English newspapers didn't pay much attention to the fact that the Baxters survived or whatever, but the French newspapers, because she was Hélène de la Laudonnière Chapu, uh, gave all kinds of interviews. And his sister says that within moments of the iceberg hitting the ship, she opened the door and standing next door, Captain Smith was conferring with the owner of the White Star Line who was in the cabin next door. And Quigg says, what's happening? And Ismay turns to him and says, you better get your mother and your sister off the ship. I, from my research, I believe he was probably the first passenger aboard the ship to get the news directly from either Captain Smith or Bruce Ismay, who owned the line. Uh, this is about 10 minutes after the iceberg has hit the ship. And we'll close up the Baxter story by the introduction of the girlfriend to the mother and sister happens in the transfer to the lifeboats. Well, what, hap what happens is, of course, there is this. Um, I am firmly convinced that nobody believed that this ship was going to go down. Uh, she was practically unsinkable, particularly in first class when you have paid the kind of money that these people paid. I've been in the situation myself. I've been in a hotel, very expensive hotel. The alarm bells go off, and I just turn over and go back to bed saying, deal, I'll deal with this when it's serious. And I think that has ha that's what happened on Titanic. These people um, didn't really believe that they were in danger. Quigg, having been told by the captain, or by Ismay, depending on who you believe, immediately goes and he gets Bertha, and he has to kind of introduce Bertha to mummy <laughs> um, and to his sister, and he puts them in a boat, and he says, will you look after my girlfriend, mother? The mother is more upset with the fact that Quigg is drinking from a flask of, of, of brandy. So she starts to berate him, not for the girl, but for his drinking. And with that, he hands her the brandy flask and says, look, it's cold out there. You're going to need this. Au revoir, bon espoir. Um, and the rest, he, he drowns in the sinking. Another picture of Quig Baxter here on your screen. I want to go to Charles Hayes, who was the owner of the Grand Trunk Railway and was in Europe on both a business and family vacation. And he was trying to raise money because his intention was to take on the CP rail line. And he dies on the Titanic as well. I'll let you pick well, up the well, story Charlie from Hayes there. Was president, president of the Grand Trunk Pacific Railroad. He was coming back for the opening of the Chateau Laurier in Ottawa. In 1912, Canadian Pacific ruled everything. You could take a Canadian Pacific ship from Liverpool, get off in Halifax, take a Canadian Pacific Railroad, stay in Canadian Pacific hotels, go all the way to Vancouver, and then take a Canadian Pacific ship to the Orient. Charlie had a deal with the White Star Line. Um, he was going to set up a chain of hotels across Canada. His railroad was going to end in Prince Rupert instead of Vancouver. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so he was over in England uh, preparing, well, making the deal with, with the White Star Line and preparing to come back for the opening of the Chateau Laurier Hotel on April the 22nd, I believe. He was there with his um, three daughters, his son-in-law, 
um, a whole troop of people from, uh, uh, there was an entourage coming to open the Chateau Laurier, which was going to be the first of the hotels in his chain. The Fort Garry in Winnipeg, uh, the Chateau Capel in Regina, and the McDonald in what, what's now the McDonald in Edmonton. And it was going to be the rival to the Canadian Pacific Railroad. Um, the dream, of course, died when, when Charlie went down in the, uh, in the wreck, and the remnants of that dream in the 1920s became what we now know as Canadian National. Uh, the government took it over, and it became CN. And his plan was the, the western post for his rail line, rail line was going to be Prince Rupert, which you believe could have rivaled Vancouver had he survived. Oh, if his plan had succeeded. There's a statue of Charlie in, uh, in Prince Rupert. Um, and um, I'm trying to think. Uh, no, it's, that's not him in Banff. Uh, there's a statue of him in Prince Rupert. The town of Melville in Saskatchewan is named for him. It's along the route. The town of Hayes, Alberta is named for him. It's along the route. Um, it's interesting now to see what would have happened had he lived. Um, and the other interesting part of this story is that he was great friends with Prime Minister Wilfrid Laurier. Oh, indeed. And he started to build the Chateau Laurier, named after the Prime Minister. And then Wilfrid Laurier gets elected out of office. Robert Borden becomes 1911. the Prime Minister. Borden comes in. But by then, the Chateau Laurier is already being built, has already been named. Um, Charlie and Sir Wilfrid were great friends. Um, Lady Laurier would babysit for Mr. Hayes's children. And um, there's a bust of uh, Sir Wilfrid Laurier that was done by Paul Chevray. Mr. Chevray was coming for the opening to unveil. You've all been in the, I'm sure you've all been in the Chateau Laurier at one point. Well, you've seen the bust of Sir Wilfrid. Um, there used to be, and I don't know whether this is still true, when the liberals were in office, the bust would be in the middle of the lobby as you walked in. And when the conservatives were in office, the bust would be off to the side. I know that from, from experience over 20 years. I was going to drop in today. I didn't have time. I wanted to see whether it's back in the middle or whether it's still off to the side. But uh, this, is the, um, this is the artist who was also part of the Hayes entourage, who did the sculpture of Sir Wilfrid that, uh, that is now in the, in the lobby. And Chevrolet <coughs> survives the Titanic, and he has a tremendous fear, similar as you told me earlier today, someone who was afraid of flying. He hated being on ships, <coughs> and he was one of the first ones on a lifeboat. Well, the, lo the lovely story about Chevrolet, he was a French artist who... Um, got most of his commissions in Quebec. If any of you have been to Quebec City, um, his most famous uh, statue is the statue of Champlain on the um, boardwalk in Quebec City. But then if you go to the Quebec legislature, there are about 12 or 13 other statues in the walls outside the Quebec legislature that are all the work of Paul Chevrolet. So what he would do is he would come to Canada in the spring. He would spend the summer here getting all the commissions. He would then go back to France, and he would cast these statues. And then he would come back in the following year to unveil them and present them. And he had a, he had a pretty good business going. But like some people hate flying, uh, Mr. Chevrolet uh, really did not like ocean voyages. And what we know about him is every time he came, he insisted that his cabin be on the very, very top deck. And as soon as Titanic hit the iceberg, and as soon as they were uncovering the lifeboats, he was one of the first people. He was playing cards when the, uh, when the iceberg hit. He didn't wait. He didn't wait for anybody to tell him he just straight into the lifeboat. And what's interesting about that is many of the men who survived Titanic were shunned 
And in fact, Mr. Chevrier died a couple of years later. Well, he didn't have time to be shunned. He went back to France and, yes. uh, and was dead. Uh, he came back. I, I, he did come back. Uh, there was a church in Levy, and his last commission was Christ on the cross. Uh, church in Levy, Quebec. The uh, fun thing about that is that when you go in and see it, he has portrayed himself. It's a self-portrait of Mr. Chevrier hanging on the cross as Christ. Next story I want to share is about the Hart family. Benjamin and Esther and Eva is the young girl that is in between. Like many passengers, uh, they ended up on the Titanic actually because of a coal strike in Europe, and a lot of people moved to a different ship. Uh, one thing that caught my attention, though, in reading your book was, and this is a, a quote uh, from Esther, the mother, where she says, after seeing a headline in a newspaper that the new ship was unsinkable, she said, now I know why I'm frightened. This is flying in the because face of God. They were going to Winnipeg. Um, and uh, it is Eva. We, we, uh, I got to know Eva in her later years. She, was, uh, she died. Uh, she wanted, I think, believe she was the last passenger <coughs> to die. But there is um, a little story that the older she got, the more she remembered about that night, uh, because it was, she, 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 was a, she was a delightful, delightful lady. And, <coughs> um, and she just thrived on the attention of being one of the last Titanic survivors. Um, I want to go to, to the next story, which is, again, getting into premonitions. This is Alice Fortune, and she had a similar tale as the Hart family. And she was vacationing in Cairo with her family in February of 1912, and she was approached by an elderly man who decided to, he wanted to read her palm. And essentially, he told her, you are in danger every time you travel on the sea, for I see you adrift on the ocean in an open boat. You will lose everything but your life. One of the, one of the delights of, of doing the research on this book is that you come across all kinds of things where history meets mystery. The fortunes, please excuse me, <coughs> the fortunes were a very wealthy Winnipeg family, and uh, she was taken off for the grand tour. You, you finish off your daughters with the grand tour. I should say, Toronto in those days, most of the passengers aboard Titan coming to Canada were either from Montreal or Winnipeg. Winnipeg, uh, Toronto, a couple. I mean, Toronto was a backwoods. Winnipeg was then the major distribution center for all of Western Canada. Uh, Montreal was the richest metropolis in Canada. So those two centers is where the wealth was. So the fortunes um, set off on this great tour of Europe. And this little incident to talk about happens in Egypt, where she is sitting in luxury in the great hotel in Egypt. And the fortune teller comes up. Uh, the other part of that story is, of course, uh, the guy who recorded it said, you realize, of course, Alice, he tells that to everybody. Uh, I see you alone in an open boat, and you have lost everything except, you know. Um, I, that picture alone is one of the things that convinced me to, um, I met some of her relatives, and when I heard her full life story, which is worth another book, uh, I was absolutely, I mean, she's just beautiful. And uh, when you know um, the whole romance of that story, uh, it's that portrait that actually said, hey, I, gotta get a, I really have to write this book. Um, Much has been written about the warning signs that were ignored by Captain Smith, um, whether or not he was under pressure, as some have suggested from the owner of White Star Line, Bruce Ismay, to get to New York faster to show the, the strength of the Titanic, the speed of the Titanic. 
But nevertheless, there are certainly some, some checkered past things um, that do point a finger at Captain Smith in the actual disaster. I don't think he was. Um, we, we have a problem here. The drift from small ships to huge ships happens almost within five or six years. Captain Smith was a very competent captain until they started building ships three times as large as anything that he'd ever sailed on before. So he, he ran a ship aground, and uh, oh yeah, that happens. Uh, <laughs> He, uh, he had a few accidents. I always think of Captain Smith, you give a teenage boy who just got his driver's license a Ferrari uh, and see what happens. Unless you know what you're doing, uh, Titanic, when, when Titanic was built, it was, so, it was larger than anything else and the draft of the ship was so um, bigger than anything else, that they had to build a special pier to accommodate it. Uh, when she was leaving Southampton, he just full speed ahead, and in the suction, another ship called the New York, almost, I mean, in retrospect, it would have been much better had the collision happened in Southampton, because then you wouldn't have had any loss of life, you wouldn't have had the iceberg. But Smith, um, this was going to be his last voyage. He was, this, this was the plum assignment. You've been with the line for so many years. You've been such a good captain. We'll let you take Titanic to New York. Um, I don't think there, there are a couple of factors here. He was also traveling with the owner of the ship who wanted to get to New York. It would have never, would have never broken a speed record. But had it got in three or four hours before it was supposed to, the headlines in the paper would be, you know, ship arrives, maiden voyage, early ahead of schedule. It would have been great publicity. Um, so he was under pressure from the owners to open up the engines, um, on top of which he really didn't know, in my view, the power of the ship that he was actually in command of. This next story about Arthur Puchin is really interesting because he's a yachtsman who he claims was ordered onto one of the lifeboats to help out. Um, he was shunned, though, by society, uh, called a coward for surviving the Titanic, and he actually later went on to provide testimony at an American Senate inquiry into the Titanic tragedy. Major Puchin was from Toronto. Military man, uh, no nonsense, yachtsman, uh, had made the, made the transatlantic cross numbers of times. Uh, being a yachtsman, he knew something about seamanship. Uh, he was not happy from the moment he stepped. Let me, uh, at this point, I think it's a really good time to point out Titanic <coughs> was not full, Titanic was only about two thirds full. In those days, maiden voyages, the people that really counted, the money, the really moneyed people, waited to see what the shakedown cruise, as we would call it, was like. So most of the people aboard Titanic, again, most people don't get the concept, were young, rich, well-heeled, the average age was 26. The average age of the passengers was 26. These were people who had the money, uh, certainly in first class, we're not talking third class, but they had the money and why not? I mean, let's go for a trip. Pearson was, um, was from Toronto. Um, when the ship begins to sink and they're starting to lower the lifeboats, I am convinced, as I said earlier, nobody believes a ship is sinking. But it's 11 o'clock at night, you've just come from a dinner party, you've been dancing, 
Hey, let's go for a ride in a lifeboat. Hey, wouldn't that be fun? We'll be back for breakfast. I mean, you're 26, you're young. So as they start lowering, as you know the story, the first boat's away. Nobody wanted to get in them. Many of the boats, the first boats that went away uh, were 13, 16, 28 people in boats that could hold um, 60 to 80 people. As they were lowering, uh, two boats, the, the stays jammed. And if it continued, two boats would have crushed. So one of the officers said, Fushin, you're a yachtsman. Get in, do the stays, and he's clever enough. He's a military man. He says, okay, well, if I do that, I want a, a little note from you saying that I have the authorization to do that because, as you know, under the rule of the sea, the officer in charge of the boat is the officer in charge of the boat. And here you have a yachtsman jumping into a boat with a guy called Hitchens, by the way, that's the same boat that um, Bertha Maney and uh, Mrs. Baxter and the, I've always thought that uh, Hitchens was drunk. And I always think that maybe Mrs. Baxter gave the brandy flask to Hitchens. That's <laughs> speculation on my part. Anyway, he jumps in and um, they go away. And once the boat is in the water, he shuts up because Hitchens is in charge. And he understands that as a yachtsman. When he gets, when he survives and lands in Toronto, everybody said, oh, yeah, 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 said he was a yachtsman. If it had been a fire, he would have said he was a fireman. Um, he lost a fortune because he survived, uh, also because of bad investments, but, uh, but he was certainly shunned. Uh, for having survived the Titanic. Uh, many years later, after he had died, uh, the officer who actually sent him into the boat wrote a memoir in which he said, look, this guy was a hero. He wasn't a coward. And indeed, I had ordered him into the boat to help save the people. But uh, that doesn't do any good to your reputation once you're dead, does it? Uh, Let's go to Harry Molson now, who... Oh, my favorite guy. Well, go ahead. I'll <laughs> let you pick up the story from there. Oh. <laughs> uh, this is Mr. Molson, uh, not of the Beer family. Well, he's of the family, but he's not the Brewer's side. His uncle, who is of the Brewer's side, dies and leaves him a bank. And uh, he is a bit, well, you can see from the from the photograph, a bit of a dandy. He um, spends his money well, let's just say he, and he's been traveling the world. He has swum away, believe it or not, from two shipwrecks. The ship goes down in the St. Lawrence River. Mary Wark, he was known in Montreal as Mary Larkwand Molson. Um, he swims away from two shipwrecks and of course Titanic is going down he sees a light on the horizon he's no problem I've done it twice before I can do it again and uh, the last we know of Mr. Molson is he's paddling to a light on the horizon um, should we get into the other story about Mr. Molson? It's, it's your time. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Molson, <clears throat> I don't want to shock anybody here. Are there any children here? <laughs> uh, Mr. Molson had a cousin who had a wife. And Mr. Molson took a fancy to his cousin's wife. And his cousin had no problem with Mr. Molson taking a fancy to his wife. So on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, uh, Mr. Molson would be with his cousin's wife, and on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, uh, Mr. Molson's cousin's wife would be with his cousin. Now, in those, days, in those days in Quebec, 
a woman could not own in her own right property, bank account. She needed her husband's permission. Uh, if you're ever in Dorval, by the way, there's a little chapel that Mr. Molson had built for his friend. But just before he leaves, <coughs> he changes his will. And in it, there is a special codicil that in spite of Quebec law, everything that he owns belongs to the young lady who happens to be his cousin's wife. Uh, I'm, this story is told in the Molson. If you ever get the book, uh, Barley in the Stream, it, 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 I mean, it's a well-known gossip story in, in, in Montreal. But there's Mary, Mary Larkwand Molson. Back to Trivial Pursuit. And here's Bert and There's Bert and Veradick from Calgary. They really existed. Um, and they both survived. And the story of how he survived, of course, was uh, one that would not be, have been flattering at the time. Well, any man that survived the sinking in those days um, would have been better. I mean, every, every man who survived the sinking, to various degrees, um, was the victim of gossip, and all of them were ostracized. Uh, the, the, the biggest one, of course, was Bruce Ismay, who owned the ship, who, uh, if you've seen the movie, gets off. Uh, the story about Bruce Ismay is that, although he lived for another 20 years, he died the moment he stepped into the lifeboat. Uh, Bert Dick um, had hotels in Calgary. Uh, after the sinking, uh, Vera went on to become sort of a uh, Calgary socialite. She had musicals in her house and uh, the house with the staircase. Uh, Bert kind of retreated to Banff, and uh, uh, but as I say, also was was uh, ostracized by Calgary society. Now Thomas Andrews took a liking to them because on May 31st, 1911, their wedding day. That was also the date that the Titanic was launched. Ed Andrews you was the architect. Read my book. I did. I've forgotten that. I've read it twice, yeah, actually. <laughs> no, I had actually forgotten that anecdote. But you're right. They sat with uh, they sat with Thomas Andrews uh, the last night of the uh, at uh, the last dinner that evening. And Andrews was the architect, of course, who designed the Titanic. Who designed Titanic. Yeah. And died with the Titanic as well. Leonard Hickman is our next Canadian we're going to talk about. Um, he had hopes and dreams of setting up a farm in Western Canada. He was upgraded actually from a, uh, into a second class ticket on the Titanic because he had transferred from another ship where he was going to be third class. Well, this is actually a fascinating story. Leonard had come out to Western Canada in uh, 1909. And he started farming at a place called Eden, Eden, Manitoba. And for him, indeed, it was Eden, because he made an awful lot of money in a very short period of time. And he had two brothers back in England, Stanley and Lewis. So he went back and he said, look, Eden is in Manitoba. You got to come. So the three boys. Leonard, Stanley, and Lewis get aboard the ship, and they're going back to Manitoba. Leonard is well known in the town. <coughs> and when the three drown, his Masonic Lodge, so highly regarded, and they learn that the body has been recovered in his Halifax, they say, we will pay to ship it out, and we will bury it in Nipawa, which is very close to Eden. Um, I was saying earlier, the, the cemetery is a beautiful little cemetery, and Margaret Lawrence, uh, who wrote The Stone Angel, is buried there. Their graves are within spitting distance. However, the funeral is arranged, the train pulls in, and they open the lid of the coffin, and everybody looks down and says, who the heck is this? 
certainly not Leonard Hickman. So they slam the coffin door shut, and they conduct the funeral as if it was Leonard. Nobody's any the wiser except the few people. What had happened was as the ship is sinking, Leonard grabbed Lewis's coat, Lewis grabbed Leonard's coat, the body that was recovered being identified as Leonard was indeed his brother Lewis, who had never been to uh, Manitoba, but is buried there in Nipawa. Um, and they found out, they were able to find out from, uh, I believe it was a pipe, his wife back in England said, well, you know, the jacket was different, but the pipe in his pocket was not Leonard's, it was Lewis's. So if you go out there, there's, the gravestone says, here lies, uh, they, I think they changed it. It, it. it originally said, here lies Leonard Hickman and his brother Lewis. Uh, Stanley's uh, body was never recovered. This is a picture of Neshin Krikorian. He was fleeing a civil war in Ar Armenia, trying Third to find class. a better life in Canada, but he was in steerage. <coughs> and one of very few third-class passengers to survive, Titanic. Now let me, um, third-class passengers in those days, again, you've seen the movie. There's some controversy over whether third-class was locked in. United States immigration laws required, once you left England, you weren't locked in, but you were contained within third-class quarters on the assumption that immigrants were diseased, filthy, and really should be separated from, we're dealing in 1912 here, separated from the good people of, of, uh, of first class. One of the, one of the um, things about the movie that doesn't compute is while a passenger from first class could go down to third if they wished, there is no way a passenger from third class could ever come up to first or second class. You were contained. Now, because he was in third class, the iceberg hits and he's got water in his cabin. Uh, he knows that there's water in his cabin, right? And everybody is saying, no, no, it's, it's okay, it's okay. He's got water in his cabin, and I don't know about you, ladies and gentlemen, but if I had water in my cabin, I would know there's a problem. So he leaps up and manages to navigate his way, throws a, there are various stories, but his daughter, who I got to know, um, one of the stories is he threw a blanket over his head. Now, whether he was trying to disguise himself as a woman, whether he, I mean, there are all kinds of, he threw a blanket over his head and he ran down the deck and as a lifeboat was going down, he just threw himself over and landed splat and survived. Wound up in Hamilton, Ontario. This is a picture of the Allisons. This is Hudson and Beth, Beth Allison. They were from Chesterville, not far from the Ottawa area. They actually um, changed their plans to be on the Titanic and at the time paid 151 pounds for their rooms, which is about 8,000 bucks in, in those days on the upper deck rooms. What's their story? Well, they, they had a, um, Beth and uh, probably, she was the only lady in first class to die. And they had gone over to England. They had just built this new the farmhouse is still there, by the way, still with the monograms in the stained glass windows in Chesterville, Winchester, Winchester Chesterville. Um, they had gone over to recruit household staff, maids. She was traveling with her daughter and her infant son. They had, if you've seen it, so many maids, the maids were looking after the maids. When the ship hits the iceberg, the maid who was looking after the boy just took the boy and away she went into a lifeboat. 
she was left with her daughter Lorraine. And a lifeboat was there and she said, no, 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 I'm not leaving without my boy Trevor. If you've ever been on a ship, you know that uh, how the heck are you supposed to know where Trevor is? He was with his nursemaid. Uh, she wasn't going to leave without making sure that Trevor was safe. So she and her little daughter, Lorraine, um, are running around looking for her boy. And by the time it finally dawns on her that maybe the maid and the boy are already safe, there are no more lifeboats. So she drowns, Lorraine drowns, and Hudson drowns. Um, a footnote to that story is uh, after the sinking, there was, a, there was a woman who claimed they were a rather wealthy family, and there was a woman who claimed that uh, Thomas Andrews had put her on an iceberg and that she, in fact, was Lorraine Allison, who had survived the sinking, and she wanted, uh, she wanted the fortune that, to which she was entitled. Uh, Trevor, the baby boy who survived, uh, died of food poisoning in a vacation in Maine, which kind of split the family because he was the guardian of one of the uncles. And uh, there's some suggestion that, uh, that he had uh, somehow uh, been poisoned so another uncle could inherit the fortune. Uh, uh, that's all speculation and gossip, but to this day uh, there, there is a rift in the family over what happened to the little boy. William Harbeck is a pioneer in film producing, actually an American. He's an American who, filmmaker who uh, is making films in Vancouver and Victoria and Seattle for the Canadian Pacific Railway, who send him over to Paris to learn film techniques. Um, I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, never die in a famous disaster. Because if you do, sooner or later, everything about you will be found out. He was traveling on the ship with Mrs. Harbeck. And when the bodies were recovered, Mrs. Harbeck had a purse, and he had, um, I mean, it was the wedding ring, the whole thing, Mrs. Harbeck. So they called Seattle and said, we're sorry to report the death of William and Mrs. Harbeck. Well, Mrs. Harbeck, who lived in Seattle, was not very happy with the news. And um, the story is that when all the bodies, of course, as you know, were brought back to Halifax, and uh, she refused to take her husband's body. And for many years, it was buried in his hometown without a tombstone. And only recently, because of the uh, interest in Titanic, has the grave been identified. It's a picture of George Wright. George was a, Van, uh, a Halifax uh, millionaire, a um, bit of a prude. Um, very quickly, George, um, um, what's the word I want? He slept. He, um, you know, people who fall asleep and... Yeah. And um, the story about George is that very few people ever saw him aboard the ship. And we believe that he may have just gone to bed and woke up drowned, um, that he, he had no idea what was going on. This is the Three Musketeers. There's actually five people in this picture, but there are three, uh, four that can be identified. But these men were all from Winnipeg, Winnipeg. Uh, which, as you said, was a significant economic force in those days. This is St. Mark's Square in Venice. 
The uh, third man in is Mr. Fortune, whose daughters we talked about earlier. And uh, you got Thompson Beatty, Mr. Ross, and the third one is, let's see, Ross, Beatty, Ross. and... Um, uh, McCaffrey or something. <laughs> they, were, they were three... Thomas um, McCaffrey. McCaffrey, Thomas McCaffrey. McCaffrey was a, a banker from Montreal. Uh, they, they were all bankers and realtors. They'd all known each other in various cities. Every year, they would go off together, every other year, forgive me, to the Aegean, to Greece, um, they were three bachelor companions. Uh, Ross was a bit of a dilettante. His, his father was governor general, I believe, of Manitoba. They were all spoiled, rich. Um, Hugo, uh, the, one that, the one that fell asleep. He was sick. He was, was he not? Okay, Hugo Ross, Hugo Ross was ill. His last postcard from Egypt is, I've had enough of this, I'm sick. He was brought aboard the ship um, on a stretcher, taken to his cabin, and we do know that when they tried to awaken him, he said, I don't care if the ship is sinking. Uh, I'm so sick, I don't care. Uh, he went down with it. Um, well, they all, Thompson Beatty, I told you that, I told you that the Titanic is sometimes history meets mystery. Thomas Beatty got into a lifeboat, but died of hypothermia. And there were three people in that boat when they, when they got the survivors. There were three bodies in the boat. And they just let them float out into the Atlantic. About a month later, they found the body with Thompson in it. Thompson's mother was born on a ship coming to Canada 80-some years earlier. They buried Thompson Beatty in the Atlantic almost at the same spot where his mother had been born. Cape Race, Newfoundland has a story to tell about the Titanic as well because SOS was a new emergency call in those days, uh, Save Our Souls, and those first transmissions from the Titanic went here. Well, in a, in very quickly, um, the guy who was manning the Marconi station in Cape Race was friends with the guy on the Titanic. I've never done the tick, 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 but I'm told that people who do this can identify, there, it's like playing a piano. You can immediately tell who is sending the messages and who isn't. And all of these um, Marconi, this is all brand new stuff, by the way. This is high tech. But the guy in Cape Race had trained with the, um, uh, with the uh, radio operator aboard Titanic. And of course, they were chatting all night long about the fact that the ship, how was the voyage going? And then, of course, the news comes that uh, the Titanic is, is, has hit the iceberg. The signals from Cape Race are transported to Montreal. The newspaper that I worked for, the Gazette, we had a marine reporter who was just getting off work. And uh, his friend was running the, uh, the Marconi at the Allen Line. And one of the Allen Liners was calling for permission to change course because it had a ship of, shipment of apples. And it wanted to know whether it should go to rescue Titanic uh, and risk uh, the apples rotting. So the guy from the Gazette immediately went back to the newspaper and said, hey, Titanic is sinking. And in those days, the Gazette had an arrangement with the New York Times. The only two newspapers in the world at that time that on the morning of April 15th said the Titanic had sunk were the Montreal Gazette and the New York Times. The story in the New York Times is uh, the editor of the paper was a guy called Carr Van Ando. 
and the signal stopped. And Mr. Van Anda said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to risk it. If the signals have stopped, she's gone down. So the New York Times, next morning, Titanic sinks. Other newspapers had her being towed to Halifax, had, she was unthinkable. It was unthinkable. <laughs> there you go. Just one of the headlines that would have been there, at last report was sinking, so not definitive. There are a number of papers that have it as listing, but it's not going to sink. It's going to be OK. Just interesting. Uh, another piece here, even in death, the class system still was prevalent in the recovery mission. There were three recovery vessels that went out to get the bodies. <coughs> they were all coming back to Halifax. Um, it's partly true. There, you can imagine, um, let's say in a town like Pembroke, all of a sudden, 15 people, 1,500 people are dead. Well, first of all, there aren't 1,500 coffins, are there? So you've got to pull all this stuff together overnight. The Minia went out with coffins and canvas bags. And as the bodies started floating up, and as they started identifying them, uh, if you were a first-class passenger, pretty good. I mean, we should really send you home in a box, right? If you were a second-class passenger, we'll put you in a bag. And if, you were third, and if you're a woman, we'll put you in a box. Uh, women had, uh, had uh, uh, they ran out of embalming fluid. They ran out, I mean, you know, it, 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 it was a nightmare. But by and large, if a body was mutilated, over the side. Um, but generally speaking, you came home as well according to the, the class and to what you would pay. Just looking at some more pictures of the recovery mission uh, after Titanic. This is Fairview Cemetery where many victims of Titanic are buried. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the, the unknown child and there was some controversy over that as well. Well, um, the cemetery is very interesting because the graves are laid out like a prow of a ship. I don't know if any of you have been to Halifax, but it, it, it's a very moving cemetery. Uh, one of the first bodies that was brought back to Halifax was that of a little baby, uh, which captured the affection, the attention, and the love. Keep in mind, citizens of Halifax had no idea who these people were. But the image of the, the child, the little baby, um, really caught the whole town and, and symbolized the, uh, the disaster. The baby was buried, uh, and they thought, initially they thought that the baby was, um, was the Goodwin, uh, I'm sorry, was um, the Paulson baby. Uh, his mother, the body of his mother was recovered, and she is buried here, and because the baby was buried there, right across, for many, many, many years it was assumed that the unknown child was indeed Mrs. Paulson's little baby, and there they were in eternity buried that close to each other. Then with the release of the movie and what I call the commercialization of this story, a television crew set out to find out who the unknown child was. So they exhumed the body. It was going to be a huge TV show. We now know who the baby is. And because it was a television crew and because it was money was involved and because there was a great deal of pressure to identify the child. The most likely child at the time was a Finnish baby um, called Inyo Palsa. Pa Palu. I can't pronounce Finnish. At any rate, they did DNA tests. And in time for the TV show, they said, 
This is it. It's the Finnish boy. There were warning signals that maybe it wasn't the Finnish boy. First of all, a pair of shoes immediately surfaced that had been taken from the unknown child in 1912 and kept as souvenirs. And that's a whole other story. But the shoes were too big for the little boy that they presumed was the unknown child. The DNA tests were done. DNA testing requires two sets of molecules, male and female. What they had done on the first child to positively identify them was do the male DNA and not the female DNA. So it turned out that the kid was not the baby that they thought it was. They did further DNA testing, and we've now conclusively proven that the baby is 19-month-old Sidney Leslie Goodwin. And now there's a big debate in Halifax as to whether the grave should be marked. For so many years, it's been known as the grave of the unknown child. Should we um, eliminate the myth and the romance and really identify it? So I think the last I've heard is that they still have kept the unknown child there, but then on the bottom, there's a plaque that says, here lies uh, baby Goodwin. Four years ago, your book became the, a CBC documentary on the 100th anniversary. Um, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on the Titanic final resting place and some of the artifacts that have been taken away and, and what your thoughts are. Many people believe that it should remain as a grave site. It shouldn't be disturbed. It has been, but it shouldn't have been. Well, the, the, the problem is the ship has... Uh, the ship has been plundered. I, um, there's, no, there's no other way to... The artifacts that have been recovered from the ship are now uh, on display. The people who have paid... It's a very expensive proposition. And the, the people who have paid to recover them, of course, want to make their money back. Uh, my concern is with the way they actually recovered these things without any... Um, scientific or archaeological approach, uh, just because a piece of coal is found on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean doesn't mean it's a piece of coal that came from Titanic. Just because a chamber pot is found at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean in the debris field does not necessarily mean it came from Titanic. I mean, there are, there are scientific and archaeological ways of determining this. And I just think that in the rush to uh, cash in on, on the... Uh, I mean, a great deal of money was invested to find the wreck. Uh, and, of course, the people who invested it want to make their money back, which is why we now have um, all kinds of traveling exhibits of Titanic uh, around the world. It's a picture from a few years ago. This is in Branson, <laughs> Missouri, which uh, actually has a Titanic museum, and that is a replica of the Grand Stairwell. You were there for the 100th anniversary with a number of descendants of Canadian victims or survivors of Titanic. Well, just a correction. I wonder, sure. That's when we were filming the documentary. Okay. Um, 100 years ago tonight, I was on the memorial cruise, on the, sitting in the middle of the Atlantic at the exact spot where the ship went down. But... Um, when the CBC did the documentary, uh, there was some talk of, how, uh, of having to build sets to, um, which would have been ridiculously prohibitive, and given the finances of the CBC, they, they couldn't have done it. So what we did is we went to Branson, and we used their um, grand staircase and their uh, sets uh, for, the, for the documentary. I want you to talk just a little bit more about what it was like four years ago to be at the exact site of the Titanic sinking. Um, let me say that uh, having invested, as, I, as you've heard, I've been peripherally and seriously involved with this story over 30, can be 30 years? Yeah, 30 years. I'm getting old. 
Um, and to actually be there, well, something happened that night. At exactly 12.20 in the morning, which is when the ship went down, uh, we had an orchestra playing Nearer My God to Thee. Um, wreaths were being thrown off the uh, ship. And suddenly there, there, we had the television lights on, but all the other lights just, we had a power failure because of, and suddenly there you are under the vast sky, and that night was clear, 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 and the stars, and there you are bobbing on the ocean knowing that you're at the exact spot where this ship went down. Um, it truly was uh, an unbelievable and, and, and extremely emotional for, for everybody until uh, the, the ceremony ends, the service is over. It's 2.20 in the morning and it's cold. So we all retreat into the lounge and hot chocolate is being served. And this guy walks over to me and says, he's a tourist from the United States who has paid I don't know how much to be on this ship. It's where's the iceberg? And I laughed. I said, I, you got to be putting me on. He said, no. He said, where's the iceberg? This man absolutely believed that the iceberg was stationary and was still sitting there a century later and that he was going to be able to see the iceberg. I kid you not. Um, We've gone longer than I expected. I know you want to close with a passage from the book, but before we do that, just one more question about the female reporter. Oh, the Toronto Star Mrs. reporter Snyder. who ended up getting a major scoop as the survivors arrived in New York. I forgot to ask. As the um, passengers are coming back, every newspaper in the world, of course, this is, this is as big as 9 11. This is, I mean, this is huge. This is the biggest. In 1912, this is the first story that affects two continents. I've always said that, that Titanic, the reason it continues is, had it been the second voyage, or third voyage, or fourth, this is the unsinkable ship loaded with rich people from both sides of the Atlantic, goes down on its maiden voyage. I mean, you were there when Kennedy was assassinated. You were there when the planes hit the... This is, in those days, as huge. It had, I mean, absolutely impossible. So every newspaper in the world was on top of it. Grattan O'Leary from the Ottawa Citizen goes on. The problem is that if you read the newspaper reports from the day, a lot of them did interviews without interviewing people. In order, to, in order to sell newspapers, there are all kinds of incredible stories being told. The biggest one, of course, is an interview with Paul Chevray, which says, my statue of Sir Wilfrid Laurier has gone to the bottom of the Atlantic with the Titanic, and on and on and on and on. The next day, Chevray storms into the newspaper office. Well, where did any, I never said any of this. Where did all this come from? The statue is safe. It's, uh, it's in Ottawa. Went over on the Mauritania. But if you read the reports of the time, you've got to be very careful because a lot of it was invented. Only two Canadian newspapers sent reporters, Grattan O'Leary from Ottawa. Um, and then women, of course, were not allowed in the business. I mean, women were not reporters in 1912. But Mrs. Snyder was the wife of the managing editor of the Toronto Star. And he said, oh, Go to New York. Um, they expected, I think, that she was going to do women's features of the disaster. You know, the story about the hats they wore as they came off the Carpathia and something. But uh, she was a pretty, pretty, pretty sharp woman. And she goes off. And when she gets to New York, she is told, lady, nowhere near. I'm sorry, go away. No press pass. You're a woman. Stay away. She pretends to be a nurse. She gets into an ambulance. And she gets straight, as all the passengers are coming off the ship, 
And of course, she gets scoops left, right, and center by pretending to be a nurse. So she's probably one of the best, uh, one of the best first-person accounts of the sinking come from Mrs. Snyder in uh, in uh, in Toronto. Before we, I mean, I, I, I know we're we're. Uh, People have said, you know, why, why a hundred years later do we still gather a crowd to talk about this ship? Uh, certainly, um, certainly the Cameron film and, and the discovery of the wreck uh, have put it into pop culture. But at the time of the sinking, the eulogies were absolutely horrific. This was God's retribution for sinful people who dared to challenge blah blah blah. If you read, and I have read them, your eyes glaze over with the God's retribution for blah blah blah. But at a funeral in Halifax, um, a priest got up, well he was, he was a Presbyterian minister, and he was charged with having to bury a body, and this is what he said, and like most eulogies, the shortest and the simplest, like Abraham's Gettysburg Address, it is fitting that our words be few and that we be quiet in paying our tribute of respect to those whose deeds speak more eloquently than words. They shall rest here, quietly in our midst, under the murmuring pines and hemlocks of our cemetery. But their story shall be told to our children, to our children's children, and to our children's children's children. Alan Gustav. Well, with stories. that, I think I've said enough, but um, I'd love to hear if you have any questions. <laughs> we are going to open it up to questions, but we'll finish up the broadcast on Kojiko now. Alan Hustick, Canadian Stories from the Titanic, part of the Algonquin College Speaker Series. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching In Conversation with. I'm Jamie Bramberger. Good night. Good job. Oh, thank you. That was excellent. Thank you for excellent. having me. Excellent.